Thank you all for coming today. We are grateful to have this special opportunity to work with the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center for Public Policy and Social Sciences to coordinate and host this event. I would like to particularly thank Director Barabas for his work in making this event very, very special today. My name is Luke Montalbano. I'm a freshman from Vancouver, Canada, and I'm the Policy Events Director for the American Conservation Coalition here at Dartmouth College. The American Conservation Coalition is a national nonprofit dedicated to building the national conservative environmental movement. Nationwide, ACC has more than 40,000 members. ACC Dartmouth was founded in the fall of 2023. We have focused on promoting environmentalism in conservative politics and in the market through discussions on energy and climate, issue education during the New Hampshire primary, and off-campus tours of sites, including a solar farm, a flood control dam, and a fish hatchery. We believe that climate policy can be bipartisan. Today, we will have a facilitated discussion with Premier Jean Charest, and we'll later open up the discussion to the audience. If you are live streaming, please submit your questions to rockyqnd at dartmouth.edu. If you are asking a question in person, wait for the microphone before speaking so the virtual audience can hear your question. Ladies and gentlemen, climate change is the foremost issue of our day. 76% of Generation Z ranks climate change as one of the greatest concerns, a statistic that transcends party and ideological lines. Policymakers need to expand their vision of what action against climate change looks like in the United States and across the globe. I am of the belief that inspiration can be taken from their neighbor to the north. Today, the American Conservation Coalition, the Rockefeller Center, and Dartmouth College are honored to have former Premier of Quebec, Jean Charest, speak with us about his revolutionary work on climate policy. As former Deputy Prime Minister of Canada and former Premier of Quebec, and with a public service career spanning 30 years, Jean Charest is one of Canada's best known political figures and statesmen. Jean Charest was first elected to the House of Commons in 1984 with the Progressive Conservative Party the major center-right party of Canada, and at age 28, became Canada's youngest minister under the late and great Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. A few years later, in 1991, he was named Minister of the Environment and Minister of Consumer and Corporate Affairs and Registrar General. In 1993, he was named to the post of Deputy Prime Minister of Canada. And under Mr. Charest's leadership, Canada was the first nation to sign the convention created by the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, otherwise known as the Rio Earth Summit. This summit was crucial in repairing the ozone layer and setting a precedent for strong international cooperation on climate change moving forward. In 1994, Jean Charest was chosen leader of the Federal Progressive Conservative Party. When Canada faced the existential crisis of the possibility of Quebec's secession through referendum, Mr. Charest was a key figure in ensuring the referendum's failure and the continued existence of the United Canadian Confederation. In 1998, he became leader of the Quebec Liberal Party, jumping into provincial affairs to continue the fight for federalism and sound government. Mr. Charest then broke a 50-year record in the province of Quebec by winning three consecutive election campaigns in 2003, 2007, and 2008. He served as Premier of Quebec until 2012. During his time as Premier, Charest initiated an unprecedented labor mobility agreement between France and Quebec and was best known for a major initiative for the sustainable development of Northern Quebec called Plan Nord. Further, Mr. Charest was instrumental in ensuring Quebec weather the 2007-2008 financial crisis better, I might note, than any other jurisdiction in North America. In addition, Jean Charest is notably the initiator of the Canada-European Union Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement. In 2012, Jean Charest was awarded the Frey International Sustainability Award 
for his vast accomplishments in environmental policy. His accomplishments go beyond what I have told you today. We'd probably be sitting here for a number of hours if I were to go through all of his work for Canada and Quebec. I think, most importantly, he has dedicated his time to bringing up a new generation of leaders in Canada and across the globe, serving as a mentor for many, including me. I hope that today you, whether a student, a member of the faculty or staff of the college, or a resident of the Upper Valley, come away with an appreciation for the wisdom Mr. Charest has to offer. I'd like to now invite former Deputy Prime Minister of Canada and former Premier of Quebec, Jean Charest. Thank you very much, Luke, and that's a, a very flattering introduction. Uh, a number of people in the room probably asking themselves how old I am, and uh, because I started relatively young in politics. I got to know Luke uh, through uh, his parents and friends, and he's on the west coast of Canada, and I'm on the, uh, on the east coast, not very far from here, actually a few hours from here. Uh, from the city of Sherbrooke uh, that I represented both in the federal parliament, the national parliament in the province, and the uh, National Assembly of Quebec. And so we got to know each other through friends and he worked for me and, uh, and I was very impressed and I'm, I'm delighted to accept your invitation to be here to speak here at Dartmouth College, which is an iconic institution. And, uh, and you must, all of you must feel privileged to be able to either work here or study here. And I, I hope you're enjoying every moment of it. And uh, the ACC is a very interesting movement. Uh, one that speaks to uh, a number of campaigns and choices that we're all going to be making uh, here in the United States with your presidential campaign. And in Canada, we're expecting a federal campaign in 2025. It's a minority government that we have, uh, led by uh, Prime Minister uh, Trudeau, liberal government, but also it's the British parliamentary system, so they're in a, more or less a coalition. There's different forms of association between parties in, uh, in the British parliamentary system, but there, there is an agreement with the NDP, which is the more left-leaning party, to support them in the House and, and support them in the confidence votes that allows them to be in government until at least 2025. So that's the expectation of an election campaign. And the issues of the environment and climate change are going to be front and center. They already are right now in Canada. Uh, the issue of a carbon tax is, uh, is the number one issue that the leader of the opposition, whose name is Pierre Podiev, has chosen to focus on. And so so all of this is very relevant to what is happening uh, right now. Uh, you've invited me to talk about uh, conservatism and, and the environment and how they mesh. And there is a story to tell in, in Canada on this, a very interesting story, one that I've been privileged to be very involved in. But I want to start by a few comments about the relationship between Canada and the United States. And uh, we've had an opportunity to reflect a lot about this in the last few weeks because the Prime Minister I was elected with, Brian Mulroney, passed away on the 29th of February. And in fact, I was privileged to be one of those eulogizing him at his funeral. And uh, of all the commentary, and it was very much a moment of grace in the country, it was a very interesting experience for us. And all countries experience that when a president passes away or a Prime Minister, we look back we reflect there's sort of a moment of communion of thought about what this era represented. And a lot of the comment about Brian Mulroney was about his environmental record and what he accomplished as a conservative, by the way. And a lot of that is in direct relationship with the, uh, with the United States and what was accomplished with the American administrations of President Reagan, uh, Bush, and Clinton because he he covered those three periods, the beginning of the Clinton administration. And I, I was part of that. I had the privilege of being part of that in different roles at different times and observing it. And in 2006, I was Premier of Quebec at the time, Mr. Mulroney was awarded a prize as the most, the greenest prime minister in the history of Canada. 
something he was very, very proud of. He was very proud of it, and, and rightfully so, because he, he was a precursor of what was to come on climate change, on biodiversity, on, on a number of issues. But I want to return, as I mentioned early, to two things, two things that a Canadian prime minister needs to attend to. There's two, not two priorities, every prime minister. The first one is the unity of the country. Uh, our country has experienced two referendums, one in 1980, the other one in 1995. I was very involved in the 95 one on the separation of Quebec from Canada. The 95 one, for those of you who are too young to remember or have noticed, came very, very close. The participation rate of the 95 referendum, to give you an idea of how intense it was, was 94% of eligible voters voted. And the difference between the yes and the no side was about 0.5%, with 94%. We came this close. And it, uh, you can I've been in, in a lot of campaigns in my lifetime, leadership campaigns federal, provincial campaigns. But in, when the campaign is about the future of your country, if that's the issue, the level of intensity and in what's at stake is, uh, is, is very, very gut-wrenching and, and a very important moment for us. The second issue is the relationship with the United States. One thing a Canadian prime minister has to get right is that relationship. And, and, and we're lucky. I, mean, I was mentioning this to a group earlier. I mean, we are born in this neighborhood. We don't appreciate it. We sort of take it for granted. But it, being born in Canada is like winning, excuse me to say this in the United States, this is what I think, it's like winning first prize of citizenship. Okay, so the United States would be second prize. And I, I'm not exaggerating. I mean, think, stop a moment to think of the privilege we have of either being born or, or being a citizen of one country or the other. And we're na each other's neighbors. And yet the, the danger, there's a few of them, is that we take this relationship for granted and, uh, and that we don't pay enough attention to each other. And it's a constant challenge for a Canadian prime minister. You are, in the United States, our most important economic partner, by far. Up until 2009, Canada was the number one economic partner of, the, of uh, the United States. That changed with the emergence of China. But we still are with Mexico. And, the, and so that's how relevant, how important we are to each other. But there's another part of it that Americans don't always see, is that the United States isn't only the most important economic power in the world, it's also a superpower. And superpowers behave a certain way. Superpowers have impulses. It's not a question of good or bad faith. It's the nature of history and relationships that, uh, that, that it would be that way. So a Canadian prime minister has to be able to manage that relationship in a way that we defend our own interest and are able to identify areas of common interest. Difficult to think of an area that is of more common interest than our natural environment. We have the longest land border in the world. And you know, just close your eyes a second and think of the North American map and everything that we have in that we share in common, on which we depend directly on our neighbor from the south and you from the north to do the right thing so that we can protect our forests, protect our the air, our natural environment, water. One of the important institutions between both our countries is the International Joint Commission on the management of water between Canada and the United States created over 100 years ago. Think of the Great Lakes and all the rivers that flow on both sides of the border in both directions and how critically important. I'll give you a prediction. And I'm not sure what it'll mean, but I know this. In the not too distant future, one of the key and most important issues between both our countries is going to be the management of water. And it is going to be a big issue. And it'll be a very difficult issue. And that is coming at us at a very rapid clip. 
And you are probably the ones, the students who are here today, who are going to be in the decision-making uh, seats and positions to help us navigate, not to do a play on words, how we deal with this issue between both our countries. And so that in itself gives you an idea of how important we are to each other and how much we are relying on each other to make the right decisions so that we can, we can manage these resources for ourselves and for our children. In the case of Canada, the Canadian conservatism story and the one that I experienced and I want to share with you is a very interesting one. Brian Mulroney is elected leader of the Progressive Conservative Party of Canada in 1983. And it's at a moment of change in the world. Margaret Thatcher is in power and Ronald Reagan is in government. And this is the period where with governments are shifting gears and starting to balance their budgets and deregulate and change their economies. And Mulroney is part of that movement and that change and that mood that we have in the world. Brian Mulroney is invited to the White House by President Reagan, an exceptional invitation. And, and part of the reason for that is that the leader of the official opposition, of Her Majesty's loyal opposition, we say, in the British parliamentary system is also a prime minister in waiting. And if a foreign head of state or government visits in Canada, they will typically meet with the leader of the opposition. It's part of the normal state of affairs. But an invitation to the White House is a very rare event. Done, but rare. So Ronald Reagan invites Mulroney to the White House in 1983. Mulroney has to decide what issues he's going to raise with the president. He chooses one issue. And he's hedged along by a, a member of parliament from Muskoka, who's in his 80s, who lives in a part of northern Ontario that is, is, is having to deal with the consequences of what we call acid rain, SO2 emissions, that is damaging the environment. And Brian Mulroney chooses one issue to raise with President Reagan, acid rain. Now, how important is that? Well, if you know anything about relations between countries and leaders, when Brian Mulroney becomes Prime Minister of Canada, what does the American administration do? They look back at, well, what is it that he cared about? What did he mention and what did he not mention? in that first opportunity to engage with an American president. And that was the issue. The gentleman, the member of parliament whose name has passed away, then there was Stan Darling. Stan was about this tall. And he was in his early 80s. And he was extremely vocal. He got up in caucus. I wasn't there at the time. said, Prime Minister, you have to raise this. And it was an issue in the eastern townships where I'm from. I'm guessing it must have been an issue here. Mulroney gets elected in 1984, and this becomes a central issue between both our countries. But the issue that the challenge we're facing is that the American administration doesn't recognize that there's an issue of SO2 emissions. We have to hedge them along and bring them along, which Mulroney did in a very, very able way. Inviting President Reagan to a summit in Quebec City, and it was around uh, the uh, Irish uh, festivities of the 17th of March. And it became, a, it, for us, it was a huge event, but he was able to convince the Reagan administration to engage in an envoy process and then move the issue around, up and around. It was a very, when you think back, en français, we'd say very habile. It was very uh, deft. Thank you. We have a few Quebecers in the first row whose job is to help me get through this speech. <laughs> deft way of advancing it. This led, I'll push forward, to the Bush administration signing a treaty, the Clean Air Treaty Act of 1990, and to implement a treaty in dealing with acid rain, SO2 emissions, which is among the most successful in the world, and one of the treaties that uses economic instruments, because there's a, a, a trading system at the Chicago Stock Exchange on SO2 emissions, a conservative solution. The Mulroney administration was front and center in implementing the Montreal Protocol to control CFCs and HCFCs to be able to control the depletion of the ozone layer, which was a key issue. We had a very real issue of a depletion of the, of the world's ozone layer not too long ago, which is now being repaired. 
And the Reagan administration signed on to it because it was the first treaty in the world done that did two things. One is differ differentiate between developing and developed countries with a different schedule of implementation, which made it possible for developing countries to sign on to it because they could actually accomplish it as opposed to a one-size-fit-all system. Someone had, at the time, enough foresight to say, well, we need to take a different approach. The second thing it did was also a trading system using economic instruments. And the Reagan administration signed on to it. And why did they sign on to it? Because they were very much a conservative government who accepted and knew that the most efficient way, in their view, of addressing these issues was to use economic instruments because it was what would be most efficient and cost effective in dealing with the problem. The Montreal Protocol today is the most, most successful environmental treaty in the world, by far. And I often, when I'm asked about these issues, point to it to encourage people to think that on climate change today, solutions are possible. We've done it before, if we put our mind to it. But I can tell you one thing, it would have not have been possible to do the Montreal Protocol without the very real engagement of the American administration and the American people who had the financial resources, the technical resources, the scientific wherewithal to help the implementation of these treaties. So the Mulroney government also hosted the first panel and meeting of scientists on climate change in 1987 in Toronto. I attended that meeting. And that led to the creation of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Inter Panel on Climate Change. Mulroney in that speech, in that moment, at the conclusion of the conference, and I was there as Minister of Youth, spoke to how important this issue of climate change would be for future generations. This is in 1987. Same year, the Blunt Brundtland Report that gave birth to this concept of sustainable development that is now part of our lives and became, the Mulroney government delivered the first green plan, a comprehensive sustainable development plan. And there's two reasons I think why Mulroney felt so strongly about this. One, he had worked in the resource sector. He had been the president of Iron Ore Canada. Canada's economy, even though it is very much a knowledge-based economy, and only 15 to 16 percent of our economy is natural resources. That is astonishing because seen from outside, you get the sense that Canada's economy is very much about, it, and it is, but our exports are heavily weighed on natural resources, whether it's forestry products or mining products, energy. Mulroney understood at the, in the 80s, early 90s, the threat against our resources and our ability to export them if we did not act responsibly in the management of those resources. They could, we could very well, and there was already movements of environmental uh, non-tariff barriers against Canadian products or other products. The other part of it is that we're a northern country. We may, on, we may produce only two to three percent of the greenhouse gases in the world, but you know what? We sure have the impact of all the greenhouse gases in the world. I've traveled to Canada's Arctic territory. It's been a real privilege for me to be there. It's very exotic. I've seen it change. We've seen the Canadian Arctic change before our very eyes. And if you meet anyone who says climate change doesn't exist, well, I'm sorry, bring them up to the Arctic. And in real terms, the people who live there experience it. I've seen it in real terms. You go to villages in the north who host a ship every summer that comes in. There used to be the, the the window to host and have a ship come to your community to deliver a house or a few houses, if you're an Inuit community, and a, few, a car or a truck would be about two weeks. Well, now it can be up to six weeks. All of this in the time in our lifetime. Literally, what we are seeing is the opening of new trade routes. The Northern Passage, controlled by the Russians. The Northwest Passage, controlled by Canada, which, as an aside, the Americans do not recognize as being Canadian. They say it's an international waterway. I want to take this moment formally to say <laughs> it belongs to Canada. We own it. And so, but this is 
this is going to change, or it's changing commerce, it's changing our lives. And this is, this is about climate change, and it's happened in my lifetime, literally. And so Mulroney understood that. We went to the Earth Summit in 1992. I was his Minister of the Environment and headed our delegation. Maurice Strong was a Canadian who headed the Earth Summit in 1992. It was a summit on the economy and the environment. And when I arrived there, Maurice Strong asked to see me and said, we need Canada to break the logjam on, on the Climate Change Convention, the treaty. We need you to announce and to make a decision that you're going ahead with it, and the Treaty on Biodiversity. And so I remember calling Brian Mulroney and the Prime Minister and reporting that conversation, and he asked me what my recommendation was. And I said to him, I, sir, I think we should. We should be. And he, his answer was very interesting. He said to me, well, then we're going to do it. But I want you to do something. I want you to call Bill Riley, who was the EPA administration of Bush father, and I want you to tell him in advance before we do it. And I want you to tell him why we're doing it. A very strong example of his leadership, who defended the core interest of Canadians, but did it in a way that also respected the position of the United States. And he felt bad, and I felt bad that during the Earth Summit, in fact, the United States were being scapegoated by a lot of other countries. I mean, each country has their strengths and weaknesses, but it was quite obvious that this was an opportunity to, to take a run at the United States and, and to avoid their own responsibility. So we did that. We were the first country. And then all the COP meetings that, uh, that followed. And we did uh, and supported the uh, Agenda 21. And so we had a very proud record. I want to finish very rapidly, I'm always I don't want to take up too much time, but when I became Premier of Quebec, I had an opportunity, it was my turn, to lead a government on these issues. We did the first carbon le levy in North America, a very modest one. It was a very interesting experience because we were expecting a lot of pushback from the oil and gas industry, and they did not. And I think they deliberately chose not to, not to attract attention to what we were doing. And it worked fairly well. And we chose to go to the manufacturer or the supplier as opposed to consumers as a first test. But we also did a carbon trading system with California. We were part of the WCI. And there were a number of other American states that were part of the group and provinces, but then there were midterm elections and they reverted to other governments and they all signed off. And we were left standing there, Quebec and California. So we did the carbon trading system, which isn't new, by the way. I mean, there's something called Reggie here in North England states, the regional uh, greenhouse gas uh, program to control greenhouse gas emissions that come from utilities in, North, in the Northeast and has been there, I think, for the last at least 30 years. And so this is something that we, we uh, believed in and thought was very uh, important. And we also did something called Plan A. Plan A, if you know of Quebec, it's a huge chunk of land that goes from the state of New York, the border of New Hampshire, all the way to the Arctic. Plan A was something that I believed in to develop in a sustainable way northern Quebec with all its resources. It's everything above the 49th parallel. There's 180,000 people that live there, twice the size of France. 180,000, I know, because I know them all individually. Four First Nations, the Cree, the Nescapi, the Innu, and the Inuit in that part of, uh, of Quebec. And we had a very extensive consultation to develop that part. But when we delivered the plan, it was for a very strong vision of sustainable development, to develop mining, tourism, culture, and, uh, and energy. But we did it, and there's a lot of strategic minerals in that part of Quebec, by the way, as there is in the rest of Canada. But as we did it, we protected 50% of the landmass from industrial development. The New York Times described it in an editorial as the single biggest land protection initiative in the history of mankind, nothing less. I like compliments, by the way. I'm very sensitive to flattery. <laughs> and we were very, pardon me? 
Thank you. Love my. Thank you. <laughs> I wish I could manage my hair as well as I could manage the environment, but I can't. So we 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 are very proud of that, and it, it, all of that is a consequence of that experience of of dealing with our environment. And so these are issues that are critically important. And Mulroney saw 40 years ahead of what was coming. How do we deal now with these issues? How do we deal with them in a way that may, will make them acceptable for the public? The real test is in the design of a number of programs. If you get the design wrong and you get tripped up in public controversy, you're, going to, you're not going to help your cause. And whether it's carbon taxes at the border or use of economic instruments, that is key to being successful and engaging your own jurisdiction and others in addressing these very important issues and to do it in a smart way, one that's effective. For conservatives, the use of economic instruments is extremely important. But again, I, I want to return to the fact that how you design them will determine whether or not they're successful. British Columbia had a very successful carbon initiative, very well designed. The other part, and I'm not going to dwell on that, of traditional conservatism uh, and, and the environment is land preservation, Ducks Unlimited, creation of national parks. Think of Theodore Roosevelt. Think of, that is also part of the tradition of conservatives and the environment. And so the next political season is going to be very, very important. I'm delighted that there is, within the conservative movement here, writ large, uh, people who are thinking about this and trying to find consensus and a middle ground on how we can make the right decision for the environment and for the economy, because it is the same, two sides of the same coin, and, and do it in a way that is smart that allow us to have an economy that's more efficient, an economy that produces wealth, wealth that we can share, and, uh, and live in a world that is going to be one that uh, we'll proudly pass on to our own children. Thank you. Well, I'd like to begin, I think, with something that's become increasingly important. And as you mentioned in your speech, cooperation between states is crucial when fighting climate change. Without agreement between neighbors like the United States and Canada, you cannot really truly effectively implement policies that will uh, aid in preventing uh, the expansion of this issue. So I wanted to ask, with the Rio Summit of 1992 and its broad successes, what can be learned for future international agreements on climate policy, particularly in wake of agreements like the Paris Climate Accords, which haven't seen as much success yeah. as the Rio Summit? And Paris is interesting because, you know, when the Paris COP uh, was in preparation, the issue of carbon taxes was not on the agenda of Paris. It, 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 it creeped into the agenda, and it became an issue. And it became a very important one in the outcome of the Paris, uh, of the Paris Accord. It was interesting to observe that. And I've been to a lot of COP meetings. I was in, uh, I was in the uh, one uh, that in 2009, and uh, was it in Denmark, which was uh, extreme. It was not successful. First one that Barack Obama attended as president. First one where the Chinese really manifested themselves, by the way. It was very interesting. The Chinese at that, at that COP meeting for the first time ever organized their own contact groups and excluded the United States. It was the first manifestation of, of certain political approaches of the Chinese. And uh, Paris then was instrumental, and I think was a pretty good success, it was a very important success and sort of a landmark. But then how do you, the, and your question's real, how do you make sure that people remain committed how do you get other jurisdictions to act? Because if they don't, well, we're not going to get where we need to go. And uh, there is a cumulative effect. I think we have to be very persistent and accept the fact 
that it's not going to be a straight line, that there's going to be a lot of moments where we're going to veer off course, and different jurisdictions will. But now, to get to the real crux of the matter, leaders have to lead. And who are the leaders on this? There's two very important leaders. You know, China and the United States represent 40% of the world's GDP. Who are the biggest emitters? China, India, Russia is at 5, 6%. The United States is probably in the range now of about 14% and has been on a downward trend over the last few years because of the closing of thermal coal plants and uh, the use of natural gas as a transition. These countries must absolutely lead. If they don't, and countries like Canada have to lead because we have the resources to do it, both scientific, the wherewithal, and the financial resources to do it. One of the issues is developing countries who want, to, and this was part of the COP in uh, Dubai, uh, where an agreement was reached to help support developing countries, and, and they moved into a speech that's more politically contentious about reparation, uh, which is more, difficulty, more difficult to, to, uh, to manage, but uh, if we're able to find a way to differentiate between developing countries and, and these major powers are able to lead on these issues, Luke, then we're going to make some real headway. But it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be a straight line. We've made a lot of progress over the last few years and we're just gonna have to be very perseverant about it. The last thing I wanna return to, I mentioned it in my remarks, you know the success of our initiatives depends a lot on how you design the program. You, have, you cannot design a program that's going to offend citizens. Because if you do, you're just, it's self-defeating. And that's very political, that is the art of politics. You have to figure out how you design it in such a way that it will be, uh, it'll be acceptable for people. They'll understand it, they'll be able to deal with it, and not feel that this is something that is going to hurt them. On a similar note in international cooperation, in both the United States and Canada, rare earth extraction is growing yeah. in major part of the economies, with nickel, uranium, cobalt being some of the most important in that realm. And so in the pursuit of this extraction, how can economic priorities be reconciled with sustainability and conservation at the same time, maybe speaking to a bit of your Nord plan uh, and the development of Northern Quebec? Let me, let me start with a, listening to your question, you know, how do you maintain one? And one thing to keep, I used to say this to ministers, we'd make announcements and they knew in advance they would be criticized because the media would say what you're announcing is gonna have an impact on the environment. Would you just get one thing clear? I'm gonna say something that's very obvious, but we need to remind ourselves of. Everything man does on earth, everything has an impact on the environment. There is no utopia. The question, the question isn't whether or not what we do has an impact. The real question is, how do we mitigate that impact? That's the issue. And how, what, what behaviors, what do we need to do to mitigate and have the best possible outcomes? So I say that because some people are intimidated and say, well, you're, you're, we're always accused of doing something that hurts. Of course, I mean, if you looked at it in that utopian way, we always would. We'd never do anything or we'd be paralyzed. You can't have a real dialogue. And so, uh, and so on rare earths, that issue appeared in the early, and I remember very well because I knew nothing about rare earths. And the first thing you learn about rare earths, if you re read about it, is that they're not rare at all. Uh, they're everywhere on the planet and uh, there's 17 different minerals associated with rare earths. Some of, one of them is uranium, a, a uranium product, and, and it's extremely, uh, it can be extremely polluting to process it. And the Chinese took, as they did for a number of strategic minerals, uh, like lithium, and took control of the process of it. And in the early, what, 2010-11, when they had a conflict, a trade or a, uh, I think it was a border conflict with Japan, cut off the supply of rare earths to Japan. I remember it very well because, I, we, again, I knew nothing about rare earths. And all of a sudden, and we were doing Plan A. An argument on Plan A was that we have every imaginable 
mineral in northern Quebec that the world is going to need, and it's strategic minerals. Back then, we, we knew that. In fact, we have the visit, as we speak, of the French Prime Minister in Canada right now. He's in Quebec City as we speak. When we had a visit from the French Prime Minister called François Fillon, I think it was in 2011, 10, we signed an MOU to give them access to rare earths. And the issue, well, why is rare earths important? Because they're absolutely essential if you want to do uh, windmills for the motors, if you want to have for military uh, equipment or armament, and, uh, and for the aerospace industry and for a number. So, but the question is, and we have all these minerals in Quebec, but the issue that we have now, and everyone, when the United States look to this Canada right now, that's what they see. But between the moment we discover a resource, whether it's graphite or li lithium, or, and the moment you can open a mine in Canada, there's at least 15 years. I'd say minimum. And every jurisdiction in the world, the United States, Europe, Canada, are all looking at how can we accelerate that process, make it more efficient without sacrificing the very important things we need to do to protect our environment and mitigate the impact. So, uh, so we have all these resources now. But I'll put to you the, real, the, the big question. If we all buy electric cars, over the lifespan of an electric car, from the moment you mine the resource, do you make the battery, and you use the car over 40 years, is it more, does it pollute more than a combustion engine? Does anyone really know the answer to that question? I've seen the answer in a few studies. Some of them are equivocal on that. Say, mm, if you're going to mine it, if you're going to do and you do the battery, and then over the lifespan of the car, it's, uh, I think most studies would say you, there's a real gain. But it's, what I'm saying is it's not obvious. We should not take it for granted. These are things we have to think through very carefully so that we are making the right choice and mitigating the effect on the environment. Similar to your discussion on mitigation, a lot of the concern for young people, at least, is that mitigation has not gone far enough. That's at least what many polls reveal in terms of Gen Z sentiment yeah. uh, toward climate action. So I wanted to ask you two things. Firstly, on urgency. How quickly and in what way should governments act both to ensure economic stability in the future and strong economic, uh, strong climate response? And secondly, why has it been, do you think, that governments, at least in the past two decades, have not been as fast acting as many would appreciate? Well, it all depends what the political landscape is. Uh, you know, for example, up until the war in Ukraine, uh, we were very much on the Paris Accord, and it's interesting you observe how the war in Ukraine uh, had the world pivot from sustainable development and, and coming out of the economic crisis of 08, 10, and, and, the, and COVID. You remember dur during COVID, the thinking was we're going to accelerate the transition, we're going to go faster as we come out. The war in Ukraine happens, and all of a sudden we pivot towards security of supply. That becomes the issue, the number one imperative. So the world changes in those periods, and the, it, it means that what you do need is a baseline among leaders. That's why these treaties are important, the COP meetings are important, though I think a, an annual COP meeting on climate is too many. I mean, there's, uh, then the event becomes more important than the outcomes. And, uh, and, so, uh, and so you need a consistent approach that will allow you to weather all the cir different circumstances of politics. Now, in Canada, carbon trading and the carbon tax, which is controversial. I would have designed it differently. I was in the leadership race of the Conservative Party about a year ago, and I, my own view was different from the carbon tax we have now. But I, I believe in, in economic instruments, and yes, I do believe that we need to uh, find a way to have a levy on carbon, and, and it's the right way to go. But right now in Canada, the issue is cost of living, inflation. And, uh, and so the carbon tax is associated with that, and it's become a very, very big political issue, and it's a negative for this government. Outside of Quebec, because we have a carbon trading system with California, it's become a very, very negative issue, uh, Luke. And, uh, and so that, that's a good example of how, uh, how the, a bad design 
and circumstances can have you veer off course. Thank you. I'd like now to open up questions to the audience. Remember, please wait for the microphone to come to you so our online viewers can hear your question in full. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand. We have two up front. Hi, um, thank you for being here. This has been really interesting so far. Um, you've talked about the global nature of climate change and how we need global leadership, not just from the US and Canada, but from China, India, Russia. How do we encourage these countries to be more green when in the past and really up, you know, still in the present, they haven't really made any moves to become green? Let, let's take China, for example. We had a COP a biodiversity uh, meeting in uh, Montreal um, a year and a half ago. Uh, it was the 15th COP meeting on the Biodiversity Convention and uh, co-hosted by Canada and China. And it, this was post-COVID. China was supposed to host it and of course, because of the shutdown, could not host the COVID meeting. And since the Secretariat on Biodiversity of the Convention is in Montreal, Montreal naturally in Canada stepped up and said, well, we will host it. And they ended up co-hosting with the, the Chinese. And it was, it, it actually, it's the, the, the success of the Montreal COP biodiversity meeting is as important as the one on Paris because of the commitments that were made to protect, what, up to 30% of our very real commitments. Stephen Guilbeault was the minister who uh, was there. He's still a minister of the environment, did just a great job. Now, the political, I was saddened by the political circumstances that did not allow both countries to celebrate their success. They should have both stand, stood up after and made the point that no, notwithstanding all the agreements that we have and the relationship between Canada and China right now is not in a good place for a lot of reasons, not in a good place, but they were able to work together to make this one of the most successful COPs of the Biodiversity Convention. And that says something. It says something. And there is an appetite among countries in the world to be able to do good and to advance causes. And we as, uh, as citizens need to encourage that, celebrate that, and, uh, and reward them politically when they do the right choice. So that's an example. That, those are the things we need to do if we're going to get, uh, make some real progress. And when that happens, it's, it can be magic. It can move very, very rapidly. I would be very impressed. You know, there are issues that sort of lag behind and there's a cumulative effect and all of a sudden things happen. Why, why is that? It's just because the timing worked. But don't ever underestimate all the work that was done before to get there. Reminds me of the old story that uh, apparently some gentleman wins an Oscar and is asked, how, do you feel, how does it feel to be an overnight success? He says, I worked all my life to be an overnight success. <laughs> Well, there is, you have to, that's why you have to be very perseverant. I believe a lot in pointing to the successes and because that success will breed other successes. It'll create that appetite. Those are the things that I would like to see them focus on. In the world, there's a lot to disagree on between China and the United States. Oh, sorry, that's my son. <laughs> and, uh, so, and India is a good example. How do we engage India? That's a difficult jurisdiction to engage with. And, uh, and yet, uh, we can't get there without them being uh, committed to this. We have another question up front. Thank you again so much for coming. I think uh, one question that I think a lot of people here have is they see nuclear energy as a very strong tool in combating yeah. climate change. But unfortunately, uh, there are issues in terms of public support for nuclear and also um, the process of getting funds and constructing um, nuclear power plants. What do you think the government can do, either from just a standalone perspective or maybe working with markets in order to uh, propel more uh, more nuclear power and more growth in that space. Yeah, and I, I, I'm, I am pro-nuclear. And uh, Canada has a technology called CanDo, 
and they're now developing a new edition of the can-do technology. Uh, I think it, it's not an exaggeration to say, I think the consensus is we cannot reach net zero by 2050 without nuclear. The other thing that we need to reach net zero in 2050 is technology that will allow us to store energy. And those are two things, two of the critical pieces that we will need to get there. And on the nuclear side, the story has evolved uh, a lot, the narrative over the last few years, from the tragedy in the United States to Fukushima. And I was in office when that happened. And I was in Germany when the Germans announced they made this, I thought it was a bizarre decision to just close down all their nuclear reactors. <coughs> it seemed very uh, fast decision. And now we've moved into a new era where there's a whole new outlook on nuclear because of energy security, climate change, and, and the security issues and the technology. And now you've probably heard a lot about what these new S, the new acronym is SMR, Small Modular Reactors. The first SMR in North America will be operational in 2028 in the province of Ontario. And it's a Hitachi uh, General Electric technology ahead of the United States. These are small nuclear reactors, probably 200 megawatts or two to 300. They could be built in a plant as opposed to a, a huge uh, construction site. And they can be moved to, let's say, uh, areas of the world where are more isolated uh, and, uh, and, and could be very, very practical and, very, and built quicker and a better price. So the Europeans and the French are into this big time. So I'm, I'm, I'm very much a believer in it. And I, yes, I do think it, uh, it can be done safely. And uh, the technology. Now the interesting thing about that happening in Canada and Ontario, and this is Ontario Power Generation and Bruce Power, they are actually building nuclear power plants on time and on budget. When they, the assumption everywhere in the world is that if you're a government and you do a refurbishing, you want to close your eyes and say, oh my God, oh my God, this is not going to finish well. You know, like doing an IT project in government. You want to say, oh my God, no, <laughs> no, 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 it's not, this is not going to finish well. Governments do not know how to do IT projects. But anyway, back to nuclear. Uh, we're now, we've now moved into a different era. So that's, that's where I see it. And we've seen that, we're seeing that here. In the, in the United States, the number of nuclear power plants that are, were scheduled to be closed and now be re refurbished. And, and you're going to see that more and more. We have time for one more question. Sure. So my question would be, as the US, Canada, and other developed countries are consistently curbing emissions, you have China, India, and other developing countries uh, consistency, consistently producing more carbon emissions. And for example, China builds two coal power plants every day. So as developing countries continue to invest in dirty power and global emissions continue to rise, uh, would you see a framework that still involves harsh limitations uh, of carbon emissions to developing countries the same way developed countries are getting those limitations? Well, thank you. And let's Let's dig down a bit on your question and what's behind that question. What, what's the story about? And, and this story is about developing countries growing their economy, and, which is the story of China. And you know, the story, of, the story of the world of the last 30 years is pretty extraordinary. The number of people who have been pulled out of poverty because of increased trade, and there's a whole new middle class that's building in China. And the same is going to come in Africa which has stronger demographics. And also Asia, whether it's the a a ASEAN uh, area or other areas. I mean, let's so all stop a moment just to remember. These countries, their view, what is their view? They look at us and they say, well, now you want me to handicap my economy. This is, I'm not saying they're right, but this is their, their view. You want me to handicap my development. I have poor people because it's going to pollute the environment. You've done it. You've made yourself rich, and now that you've accomplished it, you want me to. That's, I'm caricaturing, but it's not far from reality if you hear what they're saying. Now, we know there's a better answer than that. It's not that uh, simple, and uh, 
The real challenge is how can we help each other make the better choices? And I want to speak directly to China. You know, if we were really smart today in the world, if we, if we had one thing to do, one thing, if I had one thing to do, I would, I would say if we really want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we need to export natural gas to China and have them close their thermal coal plant and that we'd get the biggest bang for the buck on reducing greenhouse gas emissions would be to replace these thermal coal plants with natural gas as an energy transition measure, not as a permanent measure. And that's what would allow us to have the most effect, the most rapidly. Why can't the world come to terms with that? I'm, in, I'm intrigued. I mean, are, are those conversations happening between Xi Jinping and Joe Biden and, and, and Justin Trudeau? Is that simple conversation happening and saying to Xi Jinping, listen, we, we're ready to help and we'll figure out what is the most effective thing we can do. And that would bring down greenhouse gas emissions the most rapidly, urgently, and it would. Now, it's not a permanent solution. We're back to everything has an impact on the environment. We don't want to stick with natural gas forever. It's a hydrocarbon. But then it gives us the time to figure out the technology, whether it's hydrogen, whether it's carbon capture and storage, whether it's storage, whether it's wind power, solar power, all of those things put together to get there. But those conversations are not happening. Do, do I sound naive? Probably. I mean, there's probably people listening to me today who say, well, they're laughing and saying, oh, this guy, you know, so simple answer. What? But it's true. It's, uh, so you're right. I mean, they, we're, at the same time, they have produced the most uh, solar, powers, uh, solar, solar panels and solar power in the world. China had the biggest output of that last year. So they're you know, doing two things. But you're right, as long as they're on that track. But remember, the basic problem is they also want to develop. And they want to do it in a way that's cost effective. And it isn't the real answer is recognizing our joint responsibility? And it isn't, we can't isolate ourselves from that and just pretend that it doesn't have to do it, the rest of the world doesn't have to do anything to do with it. And if, we're able, if we have leaders able to do that and bridge that, well then, well, that's where we get to be in a better place. I'd like to thank Mr. Charest thank for you. coming to Dartmouth today. And if you'll all thank join you. me in thanking him.